All right, so uh, welcome everyone to this uh, first session of the new series from Weber Scholars Network. Uh, Weber Scholars Network is a, a network breaking together scholars and people interested in Max Weber uh, from all around the world. And today I'm very happy to introduce um, our first discussion from a series titled Max Weber's Political Theorist, Domination, Democracy and Revolution in the Late Writings, 1917 to 1920. And this will be, this kind of more political Weber will be the focus of a series of, uh, of online events, hopefully maybe one uh, live as well, that will start now and go through to the first semester of next year. Um, so according to Max Weber, democracy is supposed to mean, well, a handy definition, as we know, does not exist in Weber's late work. Instead, we are confronted with manifold, context-specific, even systematic statements, up to and including the much discussed and disturbing definition he gave in a conversation with General Ludendorff. In a democracy, the people elect the leader and then have to keep their mouths shut. In this session, Edith Hanke will present uh, four aspects of Weber's understanding of democracy in this period in the form of thesis, which will be discussed with uh, Sergio D'Amata and Yves Saint-Omer. So um, it's really my pleasure to introduce this, this great panel for today. Um, Edith Hanke it was the general editor of the Max Weber Gesamtausgabe, the complete edition of Weber's work that is, was concluded uh, very recently and remains in, and is now in charge of the digitalization of that uh, project with the Bavarian Academy of Sciences. And she will present her fourth thesis on democracy in Max, Weber late, uh, Max Weber's late work today uh, and discuss, it, discuss them with uh, two guests. Uh, Yves Saint-Omer, who's a professor of political science at Paris 8, uh, and Sergio D'Amata, professor of history at the Federal University of Ouro Preto. So just as we like to do in these events, um, we have three people from uh, different countries and all of them in, from different areas. We have a sociologist presenting and discussing with a political scientist and a historian. And I guess with Weber, uh, even if it's the political Weber, it still interests us across the disciplines. I guess that's uh, that's a hallmark of his thought. So uh, without further ado, I guess I will um, give the floor to Edith, who will speak for about 30 minutes on her fourth thesis on democracy, Max Weber's late work. After she's done, uh, Sergio D'Amat and then Yves Saint-Omer will have, each have about 15 minutes to discuss and we will open it up for the audience. If you already have a question, you can write it on the chat and we will uh, read them out later. But we have a really great audience today, so I'm also looking forward to your questions and for our debate. So Edith, the floor is yours. Can you see the screen, everyone? Okay. A warm welcome to everyone and thank you, Victor, for introducing our series on democracy by Weber. At the beginning, I would like to make three remarks uh, on the subject. First, in addition to the current situation, the topic also has a long history. Scholars have fiercely debated Weber's statements on democracy especially the question of whether Karl Schmidt was a legitimate student of Max Weber. Johannes Winkelmann, the most important editor of Weber's writing in Germany after the Second World War, tried to establish Weber as a good Democrat in the post-war Germany. Second, the topic has also a very personal dimension for me. There are contra uh, contradictory, disturbing statements by Weber about democracy, such as the statement Victor already quoted from the conserva uh, conversation with General Ludendorff. In the last years, I've been thinking about the question, what did Weber mean by democracy? Are his categories still compatible today? What did Weber mean? And what kind of Democrat was he? Can he even be an orientation for us today? So my second. Third remark. 
the treatment of the topic is difficult because Weber did not give us a handy definition. Consequently, we must browse, look, and read his work very closely. For our series, I have compiled a selection of texts in German according to the Max Weber Gesamtausgabe and in various English translations. I will also refer to some of these quotations later on. First of all, and this is my basic observation, democracy is not at the center of Weber's writings, neither early nor late. It is treated rather casually. In the title, the word democracy is found only in two texts in the complete work, on the situation of bourgeois democracy in Russia, 1906, and suffrage and democracy in Germany, 1917. Both texts have been written by Weber for current political events, but with a clear sociological point of view. This is omitted by the English translation in the political writings as constitutional instead of bourgeois democracy for the Russian contribution. From 1917 onwards, Weber increasingly commented on democracy in his political writings and speeches. His theoretical reflections on the upheaval of 1918 did not come to an end due to his sudden death in June 1920. Consequently, we are dealing with fragmentary statements in his latest work. The unfinished is a challenge. I would like to approach Max Weber's understanding of democracy in political and scientific conceptual terms. For this reason, I have formulated four theses that highlight different aspects that I would like to discuss with you, Eve, and then Sergio, and later on with all of you. First thesis, Max Weber's specifically sociological point of view focuses on democratization rather than democracy. Weber is interested in democratization as a process. This is a dynamic and not a static approach. In my opinion, this marks the difference to a purely political theoretical view of democracy. Therefore, his approach cannot be evaluated solely on the basis of political science criteria. And this is maybe a first answer to our general question, was Weber a political theorist? First differentiation. Weber distinguishes between social and political democratization. Both processes take place in parallel, but also in opposite directions. Political democratization means the formal, legal, equal, uh, equal treatment of all citizens, specifically equal suffrage for all citizens, including women, in contrast to the Prussian three-class suffrage, which was valid until 1918. Social democratization means the elimination of status differences. These are leveled. Now, a very nice story beside. In 1920, Max Weber was surprised that his housemate, Kea, was taken out to dinner by a bourgeois admirer. According to Weber, this is real democracy. That means the abolition of class barriers. In the United States in 1904, Weber observed that despite social and political democratization, there were new social differentiations. Those who did not live on the right street did not belong to society. In other words, income and housing conditions become the criterion for demarcation. This entails the risk of money domination or plutocracy in German. Okay. Uh, ideally, political and social democratization go hand in hand. That means there is a close interaction. For Weber, democracy presupposes social maturity. He mentions certain formwerte, translated as form values, that are necessary as in English and Latin societies. He considers that the Germans, a plebeian people, is um, politically immature for democracy because of this lack of social form values. 
The attitude of the Russians in 1905 was comparable. Second division. Max Weber is particularly interested in the interaction between democratization and bureaucratization. Due to formal legal equal treatment, both processes promote a leveling of class differences, or as Weber puts it, a passive democratization. As a politically engaged citizen, Weber is concerned about the increasing bureaucracy that can no longer be controlled politically. Through its knowledge, the bureaucracy restricts personal freedom and disempowers political decision makers, even in democracies. Therefore, Weber's political question is, who controls bureaucracy? His horror scenario is one of an uncontrolled bureaucratic rule. Weber systematically excludes the possibility that large that modern large territorial states can exist without a bureaucratic and professional administration. Bureaucratic organization is essential from an administrative point of view. In his speech, Socialism, in 1918, he states, in large states everywhere, modern democracy is becoming a bureaucratized democracy. My next thesis. Democracy in its pure form is an ideal type, but not a type of domination or rule. Weber uses democracy mostly in quotation marks. This means a critical distancing use of the term. So what does, it mean, does he mean when he talks about democracy? Weber only occasionally specifies what he means by pure, true, or genuine democracy. He starts from the ancient model of democracy. Citizenship is exclusive with rights and obligations. Every citizen must be able to hold political and military office on a temporary basis. First of all, this means economic independence, and a certain standard of living without regular employment or enterprise. The introduction of diets is already a step towards extending democracy to broader sections of the population. The administration carried out by the citizens of the polis themselves is an unprofessional dilettante administration. The criteria for an ideal typical definition of pure democracy are derived from this historical model. Pure democracy therefore means the identity of rulers and rules, the ideal of rule-free in German Herrschaftsfreie Gesellschaft, or at least of keeping the scope of power of command at a minimum. And last but not least, it means self-government. Purely democratic administration takes place on the assumption that everybody is equally qualified to conduct public affairs. Thus, the administration is in the hands of a limited number of people, roughly of the same status. It functions only in territorially limited associations. Examples are the old Swiss cantons, universities, or clubs. Weber concludes from this that a purely democratic administration is no longer possible in modern territorial mass states. The fourth type of legitimacy. The brief mention of a fourth type of legitimacy of domination can be found in a newspaper report on Weber's lecture, Problems of State Sociology, which he gave in Vienna on October 25, 1917. The report states, and you can also read it on the screen. Finally, he, Weber, went on to explain how the modern development of the Occidental state has been characterized by the gradual emergence of a fourth idea of legitimacy, that rule which at least officially derives its own legitimacy from the will of the rule. In its early stages, it is still far removed from all modern democratic ideas. 
Its specific vera, however, is the sociological structure of the Occidental city. Max Weber does not return to this fourth type of legitimacy as a own category in his new version of economy and society. There, he integrates democratic legitimacy into the new typology of rule as a reinterpretation of charisma alien to domination. Paragraph 14 reads in the translation of Key Stripe as follows. You can also read it on the screen. The principle of charismatic legitimacy is authoritarian in principle, but it can be reinterpreted in an anti-authoritarian manner. With the increasing rationalization of organizational relationships, the acceptance tends to be seen not as the consequence of legit legitimacy, but as its basis. This means democratic legitimacy. Many supporters of democracy are frustrated by Weber's systematic classification. However, Weber's sociology of domination is concerned with the relationship of superiority and subordination based on authority. In the classical case, the relationship between lord and servant or between ruler and administrative staff. It is important to know that in Weber's time, the distinction between Herrschaft, domination, and Genossenschaft, uh, which can be translated as fellowship or cooperation, as established by Otto von Dierke in, the, in his constitutional history, was decisive. Domination and fellowship are thus two antagonistic basic principles of constitutional development. Sworn communities of legal associates, democracy, and self-administration are part of the concept of cooperators, or Genossenschaften. Weber's chosen point of view of domination systematically excludes cooperative forms of fraternization, association, and legitimacy. The formulations of the non-legitimate root of the city, or the reinterpretation alien, to domination are therefore makeshift constructions. So I have prepared a short excursus on English translation, but I will leave this aside. Maybe we can discuss this later on. My third thesis. The plebiscitary leadership democracy is not the only possible form of democracy in modern mass states. It is a discussion I started a year ago with Yves saint Tomé in Cerisy. He criticized my assertion that the plebiscitary leadership democracy of Weber was only a transitional type, but not his very last word. Yves interjection made me very thoughtful. I had to admit to myself that, like many supporters of parliamentary democracy, I had relied on reading Parliament and Government of 1918 and had largely ignored the later political writings of 1919. The question arises whether, in view of the systematic conditions of modern societies, there is no alternative to plebiscitary leadership democracy, and this is a very serious question. Here's the famous passage of politics as a vocation. But the only choice lies between a leadership democracy with a machine and democracy without a leader, which means rule by the professional politician who has no vocation. First division. Max Weber's focus on the leadership democracy is contextual. In Economy and Society, Weber states, leadership democracy is therefore generally characterized by a naturally emotional dedication to and trust in the leader, which tends to result in an inclination to follow the most extraordinary, most promising leader who de deploys the most attractive means of persuasion. This is the natural basis of the utopian element in all revolutions. 
Already in Parliament and Government uh, in 1918, Weber sees one of the main tasks of the Parliament in the leadership selection. Here, the selection still takes place via the parties and their followers. On the other hand, the classical tasks of Parliament, like political decision-making, legislation, representation of popular sovereignty, do not play a central role for Weber. In addition to the leadership selection, Weber sees the task of the parliament in the approval of the budget and in the argumentative negotiation of political compromises. Weber's point of view here is an empirical one. He is interested in constitutional reality, not in constitutional theory. Weber's late political writings revolve around the question of how Germany can reposition itself in domestic and foreign policy after the war. Weber saw very clearly the weakness of German politics and society. He did not, not consider German society to be major enough for a democracy, as he emphasized several times. Now the quotation. In Germany, we have demagogy, uh, uh, and the influence of the rebel without democracy, or rather because we lack orderly democracy. He was bitterly disappointed by the failure of German parliamentarism during the revolution of 1918. The failure in authority of the people's representation rooted in the belief of the nation, however, opened the way to revolutionary dictatorship. In Weber's eyes, German society needed strong political leadership for domestic and foreign policy reasons to ensure the symbolic unity of the federal state, especially after the defeat of the war. Even after the revolution, Weber favored a parliamentary monarchy for Germany, not a parliamentary democracy. Because of the Bolshevik October Revolution of 1917 in Russia and the revolution in Germany in November 1918, Weber felt a deep distrust of the masses. He feared that in a socialist mass society, there would be even more bureaucracy in all spheres of life and even less personal responsibility. Against all the threats from within and without, he relied on the charismatic, responsible political leader for Germany. So the question of alternative forms in democracy, of democracy in modern mass states. In economy and society, Weber favors plebiscitary leadership democracy for modern, modern mass states for systematic reasons. These reasons, however, are dictated by the question posed by the frame of economy and society. And this is about the relationship of the type of domination to society and the economy. The most rational forms in each case are ideotypically monocratic, bureaucratic administration on the one hand and modern rational enterprise capitalism on the other. In Economy and Society and the late lecture, Sociology of the State, Weber mentions under the keywords collegiality, separation of powers, representation and parties, a number of forms of rule that also occur in modernity. Due to his general question, he considers most forms of rule to be unsuitable with the conditions of modern mass states. He always differentiates those aspects that either promote or hinder modern rational forms of administration and economic activity. So we have a small set of main forms. And the first form, the immediate or direct democracy, um, isn't yes, sufficient in Weber's eyes um, to um, fulfill the administrative tasks in modern mass states. So, this form is out of our discussion. The second form is the representative democracy and with its main type or subtype, the parliamentary democracy. And here, 
the formal separation of powers with clear responsibilities meets the economic demands for formal rationality. So it's good on the one hand, but on the other hand, the complexity of decision made, making is an inhibiting factor for modern economies. The third main form is the plebiscitary democracy and especially the plebiscitary leadership democracy. Uh, economy prefers monocratic st uh, structures for quick decisions, but this form is against formal rationality and because it um, supports the emotional elements and material postulates of justice. So it is not very good compatible with the formal rational uh, aspects of modern capitalism. Then I listed uh, some subforms, but I believe that um, here. Uh, and then we have, last but not least, the mixed forms. This is, uh, for instance, leadership collegiality with the federal council and the national parliament. This is the political system of Switzerland. And then we have plebiscitary parliamentary democracy. Uh, in this mixture, mixture it is um, the political system or government of the United States of America. And here we have the other problem that there may arise uh, conflicts because we have different pr principles of legitimacy. So completely excluded from treatment and economy and society for systematic reasons are all formless forms of political action. And this means especially the democracy of the street. This means the uncontrolled um, actions, um, the, yes, the uh, seductiveness of the masses by demagogues and Weber made some very interesting remarks on it in its political writings, and you find some of these quotations in the text selection. In politics, Weber rejects everything irrational, disordered anarchist. In his late writings, he mentions a deci as decisive criteria for politics and even for um, society, this is rationality, order, stability, personal responsibility. These are, of course, cultural Protestant and bourgeois values. For this reason, Weber is convinced that there will be, that there will be no sustainable order in Germany without the participation of the bourgeoisie. In his last lecture, Sociology of the State, he also concludes that plebiscitary leadership democracy have a rational effect if they are supported by the classes of ownership, the bourgeoisie, and the opposite will happen where social dictatorship is shored up by the dispossessed masses. Under these conditions, orderly plebiscitary rule loses its transitory character. This is an argument for if. <laughs> Here again, Weber's specific perspective becomes apparent, which is sociological, oriented towards empiricism and the interplay of many individual factors. So my last big, big thesis. For Weber, democracy is not a concept of value. Weber's guiding question in 1918-19 is, what is the best solution for Germany constitutionally, socially, but above all with regard to the foreign policy situation in the constellation of the European and American victorious powers? Weber's unambiguous value is the German nation. On the other hand, the question of the form of government is of secondary importance to him. On July 16, 1917, Weber wrote in a private letter to the philosopher Hans Ehrenberg, a Democrat with socialist leanings in the dialect of Berlin, Die Staatsform ist mir wurscht. I don't give a damn about the form of the state. And later on, he added, forms of the state are for me mere techniques, just like any other machinery. 
This completely sober view of the state has earned him the reputation of being a state technician, technician a relativist, among others, from Friedrich Meinecke. First aspect. The value implications of uh, our current concept of democracy in comparison to Max Weber. As a liberal citizen, Weber did not want to make his own values the standard for everyone else, but wanted the de democratic form of government to be limited to its formal aspect of legal equality, formal regulation and separation of powers. In doing so, he clearly distinguished himself from the material demands for justice of the German and Russian revolutionaries. In comparison to Weber's sober attitude towards democracy, one thing becomes clear, and with this, he holds us a mirror. Is democracy also simply a technical form of state for us as well? What exactly do we mean when we evoke democracy? With democracy, we usually mean the constitutional anchored liberal parliamentary democracy that stands up for human rights worldwide. Behind these human rights lies a long history of ideas conditioned by the European Christian Enlightenment movement. So basically, it is rather a broad ideologically underpinned package that we label democracy, a morally highly charged concept of values. Besides, aren't we convinced that democracy is the best form of government? So, last slide. Opportunities of a value-neutral, open concept of democracy. In my view, Weber's concept of democracy can be understood in accordance with his methodology as a value-free concept. Democracy as a, social, as a political system is value-neutral, but it offers, together with the protection of the Constitution, the possibility of settling conflicts of interest and values according to rules and thus forming a common foundation of coexistence for all citizens, regardless of their origin, gender, religious or cultural background. With Weber, one can learn in all sobriety that democracy as a form of government provides many possibilities for adaption and design, Weber's so-called mixed forms. From this perspective, of, uh, from the perspective of political sociology, it is crucial that the form of democracy matches the form of society. The content, on the other hand, is changeable and subject to cultural and historical development. With Weber, we can learn that democracy is not a static concept, uh, but that democratization is a social, political, and thus very complex and open process. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Edith, for the fantastic talk. Um, so without any further delay, I'll uh, open the floor to Sergio D'Amata uh, for his comments, which will be followed by uh, Yves saint -Omer. Go ahead, Sergio. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank, of course, uh, the um, Max Weber Network and uh, for, for the invitation and for having me. Um, I'd like to make some very short uh, comments on what um, Edith presented us. Um, there is a very nice cartography of Weber's um, writings on democracy. So <clears throat> the decisive question in our discussion could be formulated in a concise manner. Was Max Weber a Democrat? It is clear that the reason cannot, uh, the question cannot be answered once for all. We need to take many nuances into account, but it's precisely for this reason, I believe that our discussion becomes interesting. For sure, 
it makes no sense to return to Wolfgang Mommsen's famous monograph or the debates held at the Heidelberg Sociological Congress in 1964. Maybe it is enough to mention that ju just three works published since 2020 to keep in mind how the discussion around Weber's place as a thinker of democracy still remains open. My Brazilian colleague, Carlos Sell, concludes that Weber was, I quote, a democratic progressive thinker, democratic in his political phase, progressive in his social phase. German political scientists are less optimistic than Sell. Jens Hockey recognized Hence, Jens Hake recognized that Weber does not have a normative theory of democracy, that he says nothing about participation, at least of the masses, and that he has a preference for charismatic decisions. On the other hand, for Hake, Weber has the advantage of not being guided by a prior theory of the political. What makes him interesting for us is his vision of politics as it actually works in specific historical constellations of politics conceived of as conceived as a universe of choices, decisions, and actions that always has to do with contingencies. In an essay published last year, Philip Mano showed that we also need to consider the things that Weber does not talk about. For instance, popular, popular sovereignty and legitimacy through popular voting. That being said, I move to my comments on the thesis presented by Edith. The first one, Weber is more interested in democratization as a process than in democracy as a concept. This aspect clearly re reflects the historical situation in which Germany found itself between 1917 and 1919. For Weber, there was just one path to follow, to follow if Germany wanted to continue to exist as a nation. This model, in general terms, should be the British. Like many so-called rational republicans, Vernunft Republicana, a word that sounds almost like a dream today, his conversion to democracy was dictated by the circumstances. But the dramatic picture of those years seemed to disturb Weber's clarity of thought and ability to systematize. When it comes to democracy, a champion of clarity like Weber seems to lose his luster he said at the same context that clarity was one of the most important things that one can achieve through science. Not that his formulations are not clear, but because in this case, a big picture does not emerge. It is fair to criticize Weber for that. Every exhaustive systematic work needs time and quietness to be accomplished. Everything that Weber did not have when he wrote his most important political essays. But we cannot excuse him for everything he wrote. His idea, which is either completely naive or deeply conservative, that a country needs maturity to reach democracy, draws attention. The somewhat conventional view he had of cultural processes despite all the new Kantian conceptual machinery, perhaps helps to explain this. I completely agree that Weber is interested that in the relationship between democratization and bureaucratization. At the same time, I would like to emphasize just one thing. For Weber, the first process, democratization, is contingent. But the second one, bureaucratization, is not. In this respect, I disagree with the interpretation of my friend Jens Hacker. Weber's political vision 
is at the same time tele teleological and pessimistic. Increasing bureaucratization conspires against democracy or rather against freedom. Second thesis, the ideal type of democracy is not an autonomous type of domination legitimacy. Edith demonstrates this thesis with several excerpts from Weber's texts, and I can only agree with her. Democracy in its purest expression would be the lack of domination, something that for Weber was possible in past societies, such as the Greek polis, or in nations with little territorial extension, such as Switzerland. In the modern world, and in mass societies, the dream of a Herrschaftsfreie Leben cannot be realized, even in the early Soviet Union. I think that the beautiful book of the French anthropologist Pierre Clast, Society Against the State, fully confirms Weber's view in this regard. As Edith shows, at one point Weber flirted with the idea of a fourth type of domination, the democratic one, but then put it aside because in his opinion, the legitimacy obtained through elections is purely formal when compared with charismatic domination. In a certain sense, Weber theoretically delegitimizes legitimacy through voting. Here we find ourselves, it could, it could be admitted, not very far from Carl Schmitt's concept of sovereignty. It, it, it shows us that when Weber talks about Herrschaftsfreiheit, lack of domination or absence of rule, he's always thinking, when he used these expressions, he's always thinking about, let's say, limited social environments or situations, for example, fellowships and cooperatives. Or as Weber himself writes in the in economy society, democratic domination is a typological limiting case. This seems to relate to a tradition of German sociological thought according to which quantity means also quality. The dimensions of a group have substantive implications. What is large and numerous is not just an expansion of what is small, but has become something else. This common thought cuts across well-known conceptual distinctions like society versus community in Tunis, church versus sect in Weber's works and also in Turch, or the small ideological political party at the one hand and the mass political party on the other, Robert Michels. For the same morphological reasons, Herrschaftsfreiheit is almost impossible in modern mass societies. And Weber is the anti-anarchist par excellence. There may be several other explanations for this, and one of them could be the following. As for Weber, the essence of politics is, I quote, domination of men by men, the search for full emancipation of humanity in the future would also mean the disappearance of politics itself. The ultra-liberal and the anarchist are just two sides of the same coin, a political theory of the liquidation of the political. Third thesis. Plebiscitary leadership democracy is not the only form of democracy. In fact, it has to be said that for Weber, the alternatives were terrible. Leaderless democracy or street democracy, a type that for him is perhaps the neck plus ultra of irrationality. But I think that Weber was obsessed with the problem of leadership. He seems deeply suspicious of the idea that politics could be something, something for the many, just as he thought of science. Plebiscitary leadership democracy is not more, it's nothing more than democracy with charismatic leadership. 
simply put, a potentially authoritarian type of democracy. Although this concept remains extraordinarily useful today, it's also, it also creates several difficulties for us. It is not just the fact that concepts on particip uh, like participation in the rule of law don't mean much to Weber. The big problem, I believe, is that Weber remains silent about the ultimate meaning of politics. We should ask in a German way, Politik wozu? What is politics for? One can say that for Weber, politics must be oriented by national priorities, whatever that means. But what about the common good, individual freedoms, social peace, and respect for the rules of the game? There are big, in some cases, dangerous gaps in his vision of democracy. I agree with the statement that Weber rejects anything, everything irrational, disordered, anarchized. And however, both in the case of parliamentary democracy, whose, gr whose great, great quality would be to serve as a school of teachers. And in the case of plebiscitary democracy, Weber seems eager to, for the arrival of the one who will take the rudder of history as he writes in 1895 into his or her hands. All that leads to an astonishing paradox. In Weber, rationalization advances in religious life, in the economy, in public and private administration. However, democratic politics apparently needs to keep its ultimate rational element, which is precisely the power of charisma. That is, politics in its most authentic and powerful, powerful forms needs to be kept, kept safe from fully rationalization. I fear that despite the sophistication of his typology of domination, the huge force of its political, of his political essays, the political thinker Max Weber remained, in a sense, a man of the 19th century. For a thesis, Weber value free concept of democracy. No doubt, what we see here is very different from his concept of nation. The 1970 words you edit quote are impressive. I don't give a damn about the form of the state. Our concept of democracy is more value laden than Weber's. But not only that, I believe that our concept is and must be richer than this. It is quite clear that the loss of legitimacy of democracy today is related to the fact that since the 80s, liberal democracies have delivered very little. Just a few years after the Second World War, Arnold Gillen, an author who had, was far from being an enthusiast of democracy, rightly observed that the legitimacy of the state in modern industrial societies depends largely on its ability to satisfy the eudaimonism of the masses. The cases of Eastern Europe, Brazil in 2018 and Argentina last weekend show that it makes little difference to have democracy able to defend itself only in an institutional way when violence, unemployment, and dis economic disorder spread endlessly. A democracy incapable of transforming part of its ideals, ideals into reality runs the risk of becoming just a concept, a concept with which important segments of our society is no longer, no longer feel existentially connected. Nowhere is the importance of values as great as here, but these values do not survive when they are reduced to words or, and this can be even more dangerous, when they undergo a process of excessive moralization. The liberal, tolerant, and less unequal society that we all want will not survive 
if its concept of democracy remains limited to a mere sociological taxonomy. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sergio, uh, for the great intervention. And uh, one of the thinkers that you mentioned, Philip Mano, will be presenting also his thoughts on Weber's relationship to Carl Schmitt in April in a session that we're promoting and the question of values and its relationship to democracy is the topic of the next session on December 7th. But uh, without further ado, Yves Saint-Omer, uh, you have the floor. Uh, I, will, I will share my screen. Um, Uh, I have a problem to share my screen. We see it. Yes, but uh, do you see it also with the pictures? Yeah, you have to go into okay. presentation mode, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can I can't have it. I don't know why. But anyway, this 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 will mm -hmm. this will be enough. So uh, first of all, uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to to this first session of the very interesting seminar with a very exciting program. I'm very proud to be able to discuss again with Edith and uh, and uh, with my uh, Brazilian colleague uh, with whom I share a lot of uh, uh, remarks. Um, so, uh, I will begin with the preliminary uh, remarks that uh, Edith uh, did. I agree that Max Weber did not give us a handy definition. This is right. And I think we have to ask us why. And I guess that there are two potential reasons uh, which, uh, which are different. The first reason could be pragmatic. Uh, Weber was able to modify what he sought in function of the huge evolution of contemporary societies, and especially Germany. Confronted to the war, to the revolutions, he changed a lot his view. But there is also, and this is not an alternative reason, but say a complementary reason, there is also, I think, a conceptual reason. It was difficult for him to find the right place for democracy in his conceptual architecture. And this is why he tried to, to order it in very different dichotomies or, 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 or typologies, but never reach a stable place uh, to order it. And the second uh, remark uh, made by Edith is that democracy, democracy was not at the center of uh, Max Weber's writing. Uh, I think this is right, but I think this is not by chance. It is also because it was conceptually difficult for him to find a place for it. Uh, and I would like to say that although I am a professor in political science, I completely agree that in order to discuss democracy with Max Weber and back beyond Max Weber, we have to include a sociological and historical dimension and not only political science restricted in the uh, strict meaning of the term. So uh, let's begin. Let's go on now with the first thesis of uh, Edith. Um, I think that uh, Edith underlines quite rightly and convincingly that political and social democratization are different processes that could go together, but not necessarily. This said, I think it is important to differentiate not only social and political democratization, but also 
in the political definition of democratization, a substantial and a formal or minimalist definition. Real democracy uh, for, for Weber uh, and beyond him could be both social and political, namely a real uh, equalization of power, uh, a democracy without domination. And this is politically, it could be politically a definition of uh, democracy, democratization. Um, Weber did not restrict his analysis on the formal dimension when he made a huge theory of the role of mass political parties with a, a strong leadership at the end of his life, he, I think, gave us something very important to understand what democracy became after the rule of the notable persons, which was characteristic of the first five or 10 decades of representative government. Um, but then we have to understand that political democracy, and I would like to stress this, is not only a formal definition, but could also be a substantial definition. The second dimension of the first uh, thesis of uh, Edith uh, is that Weber was interested in the relation between democratization and bureaucratization, and that the worst scenario Weber can envision was and control bureaucratic rule, and that the key question for his political ideas, but also in a sociological point of view, was who can control bureaucracy. But I think that to this question, the late Weber clearly answers that only charismatic leaders and rulers could control bureaucracy uh, in the prisons. Um, there is never any hesitation about the impossibility of a popular control of bureaucracy in the present time. Mass political states are necessarily bureaucratic for Max Weber. And instead of seeing parliament as the most crucial countervailing power to bureaucracy and to the charismatic leadership, the late Weber thinks that only the decisive action of charismatic leaders can mobilize the masses within the modern political rationality uh, is the solution for not only Germany, but for at least the Western countries. On thesis two, the idea that democracy is an ideal type. Uh, I think that Edith makes, uh, proposes a brilliant and convincing summary of the different Weber's definition, but I disagree that democracy in Weber is really an ideal type. Re ideal types in Max Weber usually are like poles, which enables us to have a conceptual map in which we can say that this empirical case is more in this direction on, or on, in the other direction, but that never, ever, or very unfrequently, an empirical case corresponds to the ideal type. If we take this definition of the ideal type as, say, uh, the conceptual pole, in, according to which we can understand where a particular society can be analyzed, then Weber should have combined this ideal type with the ideal type of political and social domination and would have said, would have said, well, 
Germany in 1918 uh, uh, is a combination of political domination and uh, true democracy, say 80% political domination and 20% um, true democracy. This is not the way in which Weber uses this concept. He always tends to say that it is impossible to have true democracy. And then it is more a limit case that you can put aside when you analyze what is going on in the uh, contemporary analysis of mass uh, modern states. The idea that the uh, Minimisierung der Herrschaft, uh, to minimize domination, uh, is not really, um, uh, uh, Weber uh, doesn't really proceed to this analysis because always he tends to say it is impossible. There are attempts, but it is not possible. And this is also why uh, he, he could say, um, uh, uh, I will, I, will, I will then present it. On thesis three, uh, Weber focuses on the leadership democracy and Edith Hunker says that it is context contextual. It would be because of the messy years of the post First World War Germany that you would focus on it. I would say that it is not only contextual, but epochal. It is for a whole era not for a couple of years. Uh, in 1918 and the following years, Max Weber doesn't really uh, keep on with the ideas that Germany was not mature enough uh, in order to go in the direction of strong parliamentary democracies like in England or in the US. And he couples his analysis of the crisis of the politics in Germany and is a historical sociology on modernity. And I think that he strongly says that knows that the masses are to some extent present in the political life and, and that the only way in this era, not only in these years, in this era is to have strong leaders who do not mobilize the masses against these two rationalities, but which accept to follow the leaders who control the bureaucratic machine. This said, perhaps he would have changed uh, his theory uh, as he uh, been able to live until the 60s because he was a great sociologist and could have changed his mind. Last thesis, uh, democracy is not a concept of value. Um, it is clear that the question of the form of government is secondary for him. Um, he distinguished from the material demands for justice of the German and Russian revolutionaries, but also for the German social democracy. Uh, he also refused the idea of political sovereignty as an ideological conception. Self-government was no more possible in modern societies, not only a complete self-government, but to introduce a strong dimension of self-government uh, was clearly not uh, compatible with his thinking. So he refused a substantial definition of political democracy. Uh, I have a question to edit. When you say we usually think that democracy is constitutional, liber liberal, parliamentary, human rights, um, depending on this European Christian Enlightenment worldview, do you share this view? Are you part of this we or do you just state the mainstream view of democracy? I think that in this century, and I, I would uh, agree with the last comments of my Brazilian colleague, I think that 
to remain with this liberal definition of democracy, which forgets, so say, the material dimension of democracy, which was defended by uh, both socialist currents, but also post-colonial currents, or feminist um, theoreticians, uh, we have a much too limited concept of democracy, and this limit is clear, I guess, in this third decade of the 21st century. To conclude, is a democracy for Weber value neutral? Um, I think that if we take the definition, the formal definition, given by Max Weber of democracy, universal uh, suffrage or masculine suffrage and rule of law, this would be banal. And we don't need Weber to have this liberal definition of democracy. I think we have to take Weber really seriously. He's an elitist thinker, but he's a great elitist thinker. It's not, he's not a vulgar elitist thinker. One can learn from Weber because of the challenges that any substantial notion or substantial experience of democracy uh, has to face, be it social and or political. The rest, I guess, is banal. If we make Weber a liberal democrat, is one among a lot of others and not the most convincing of the liberal democrats. But I think that if we take his definition of democracy or his definitions of democracy, because there are several ones, uh, seriously, they are far from uh, value neutral or value free. His basic idea is that political history is made by the few. This is a norm. Any sociological history is a role of the masses is quite limited. They are present in modern mass societies, but they are passive uh, if they are to be compatible with rationality. If they are active and not guided by a strong leader, then uh, they become irrational. As such, and Weber says it again and again, the mass is irrational. This is um, quite a common topos of the elitist thinking of Weber's time, but also in our time. It is what Etienne Balibar calls the fear of the mass. And it is not only against street democracy, but on against all form of self-rule or self-government. A real democracy, both social and above all political, is excluded, even in Switzerland. In fact, the rich govern, uh, would say Weber. The demagogue is typical for a whole period. It's not only for a couple of years. It is therefore crucial that the people can be rationally ruled instead of irrationally ruling. So in this perspective, the, uh, democracy is far from value neutral, value free. So people elect the leader, but then shut up. It's not only a joke. Uh, it's also the place that is given to democracy uh, in uh, the conceptual framework of Max Weber, late historical sociology. And this is not value neutral. It is also this definition of democracy, which explains why Weber, uh, strongly opposed to not only to the German and Russian revolutionaries, but also, I would say, to any attempt to develop a more participatory or what we call today uh, deliberative uh, democracy, including the activity and the autonomous activity of the masses and the popular control on 
bureaucracy and on the leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eve, for the provocative uh, intervention. I think we have lots to discuss. And before I uh, open the floor again to edit, so if you have any questions, you can raise the virtual hand or put it in the, sh the chat. And then we will collect a few questions and go back to edit once more and the other speakers, of course. So Edith, would you like to respond? Um, yes, if I would respond to all your very good remarks, we would take, I think, two or three hours again. Um, so I think it's quite interesting, the both perspectives. Um, on the one hand, Sergio as historian, and um, you, Eve, as a systematic political scientist, and with a very critical perspective to Weber uh, and even to my thesis. Uh, and maybe, um, yes, I should rethink my thesis in the respect that there are more substantial points. And uh, because I decided to explain a lot of it, um, by the situation and the context. Um, so um, I tried to combine Weber as a political citizen and the systematic thinker. And I believe that there's still this difference because the political or the scientific reflection didn't come to an end because of his death. So we have many open questions and we don't have the final concept and final, yes, uh, point or the, 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 um, the goal of Weber's um, political sociology because many parts are not written, uh, which the part which uh, Johannes Winkelmann tried to um, combine well, from several text parts. So, um, yes, I think you are right, just for the uh, last point, that Weber is an elitist thinker of democracy, um, maybe quite male in our perspective, um, yeah, and my reflection or my definition of the concept of democracy was just that I uh, noticed there is a very big difference because Weber's understanding of democracy and the understanding of democracy which we have after 1945. And this is, of course, um, very much influenced by the American thinking of political and social uh, modernity and modernization, of course. So this we is a little bit to understand in inverted commas. Uh, and I was a little bit shocked uh, during the preparation because I um, made some researches on democratization and I found a paper of the political uh, Bundeszentrale, uh, Zentrale für politische Bildung, and they understood democratization as a concept of peacemaking in other countries. And I think this is quite um, imperialist. Uh, and um, my idea was, with Weber to look what are the uh, historical and cultural um, yes influences of non-European societies and their other understanding of democracy or of making decisions in a community, in a village or what else. And that we as European um, must be more modest and say, okay, you have other forms of decision making, and this could also be named as democracy. Or, and uh, I think this is quite important, this openness 
to see what are the social and political um, aspects um, in other countries and other societies. So thank you. And I think it's time to open the discussion because it's very, very interesting. And we have many, many points. And thank you so much. You invested a lot of time <laughs> to reflect my thesis. And I think there is, um, yes, much to think over and to discuss. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Edith. Uh, and yeah, I would like to, to tell both uh, discussants that if you want to publish these interventions in text form, even if it's not uh, in a state that you would publish in a journal, I think this would be this would be great for, for all the community around this network. And so does anybody want to ask a question or do any of you, Sergio or Eve, do you want to come back on something that Edith said? No, okay. No questions with this audience. I'm surprised. Um, I like this idea, uh, Edith, that or the provocation from Eve, if, if who was this we and what's Weber, Weber's relationship to the mainstream view of democracy? Because what, as Eve said, Weber is quite clearly an elitist. And perhaps that's also the mainstream view of democracy, though it doesn't present itself as such, right? So Weber, it, the mainstream view converges with Weber in some aspects that it doesn't admit or that the mainstream discourse doesn't admit and uh, is, you know, diverges in others, um, especially this kind of value Latin um, aspect of it. The, democracy is a value unto itself. But I guess this is a great find that you did, that you made, um, that democratization. So in a way, I guess the this institution, which is responsible for political education in Germany, doesn't feel that there's any more democratization to be done in Germany. It's uh, the process is already concluded. <laughs> uh, just in other countries, maybe there's still work to be done, maybe with Germans' help. <laughs> uh, that's a great find. So, anybody want to make any interventions? Lucia, yeah, Lucia Pinto. Oh, I didn't introduce myself. Also, I'm Victor Schuzeri, uh, one of the coordinators of the network. And now Lucia Pinto, who's a researcher from Argentina, but who is in Munich now, I think. Uh, we'll yeah. Ask... Okay, go ahead. <laughs> we are so close uh, to Edith. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Edith, for this such interesting presentation. It made me think a lot. Uh, I have a question about uh, this is uh, one. Um, and what what I am thinking is um, as as a process as thinking democratization as a process as as you say, um, can we think that uh, democratization has many causes as rationalization has that Weber recognizes as a process that has a lot of causes. Um, uh, so we can think the same about democracy democratization and what what can be the causes of democratization uh i am thinking uh, in political democratization and social democratization in both ways uh you, you have uh exposed um, um about the the process of uh, democratization also um i think in max weber the process of rationalization brings good and bad uh, outcomes uh the the equality of the law but also uh it restricts uh leadership uh, movement so we can think the same about democracy uh that uh can brings good and bad things um and the last uh the last question or reflection of something to to share um about the process of democratization in Weber's uh, work uh can we think uh, it as a progressive process or it can also regress uh i am thinking now in argentina's alarming present if we always are uh, going forward or we can also go back uh in a democratization progress process sorry thank you Thank you, Lucia. Um, Edith, uh, if there are no other questions, would you like to respond? Um, 
the last remark, uh, whether it's only a progress or a possible regress, I think everything is possible. So uh, development is not uh, closed by anything. So um, it can be a development in the, uh, yes, for maybe as we think a better development of more democratization or um, like I told the um, example from the United States that maybe the money or the income is a new criterion of division or of, um, yeah, of new status groups. And um, that's the one point. The other point is, of course, there are many causes and what I think, what is really interesting that Weber, for instance, speaks at the second um, conference of the German sociologists about the democratization of cultural goods, of education and language. So this is not only a democratization um, in the sense of participation, in a political way, but also economic goods and then the cultural goods, which is very, very important. And I think this is also the ideal of the Evangelisch Soziale movement. And I found that democratization was there quoted by Friedrich Naumann. So to have the uh, partaking of many, many social classes uh, to the cultural goods, national cultural goods in Davis meaning. And um, I think this is also today a very important aspect of democratization. It's the democratization of knowledge of cultural goods also. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Edith. Uh, Gangolf, Gangolf Hubinger now. Okay, now I'm on. Thank you so much for these uh, very uh, impressive presentations, all the three. And I learned a lot as an editor of Weber's political writings. I have many questions, but I will concentrate on only one. That is, uh, do we have uh, to keep in mind that when Weber writes and speaks about democracy and democratization, he has in mind that Germany has to build up a constitution and a constitution that works. And there are, I think, three aspects I want to ask, especially Edith. That is the relation between democracy and federalism. I missed the name of Hugo Preuss, um, with whom he, um, whom he met in Berlin to build up this constitution. So what is the relation between uh, democratic uh, rulership and the uh, federal organization of the German nation state? And combined with that, the relation between, you mentioned it one uh, in your third thesis, between democracy and capitalism. I think this is uh, uh, very important. Uh, the, my first uh, part of the question is to the political system, the second part to the sociological order of the German constitution in the revolutionary situation of 1990-1920. Thank you. So the first question, I think the highlighting or Weber's necessity of a political leader is due to the federal system of Germany. So he wants to have the symbolic unity of the German state, nation state. And I think what we now see in Argentina, federal states have even more problems um, because they need a, a symbolic person or 
um, institution, whatever, uh, to yes, uh, to to symbolize the unity of the country, and this is much more difficult with uh, collegial uh, bodies, um, like in Switzerland. Switzerland is a very a small country with a very um, good democratic tradition. And I think this is maybe Weber's tension to, um, yes, to maybe overemphasize the uh, relevance of the uh, Reichspräsident. Um, and uh, yes, I hope that we will discuss this problem in our section about law and um, the uh, constitutional law in January. Um, what is right, and I should have more highlight the uh, relevance of the constitution for dem democratic systems, because without constitution and to speak with various types of legitimacy, um, without the rational legal legitimacy, no democracy will function at all. And this is an aspect we mostly forget when we speak about Weber and democracy. I think for him as a jurist uh, or someone with a juridical uh, education, it is, um, Yes, non-discussable that we need that, and he, I think, he couldn't imagine that um, elected leader of the state would himself um, or would damage the constitution. So, ruling rules are very important for democracies. Is this an answer for your question, Gangolf? The first part. Um, Democracy and capitalism, I think the a part of the answer is in the quotation of the state sociology of the lecture, that it will function with strata or classes which act in a rational kind. So, All right, um, before I... I... Open the floor to Eve, who would like to intervene as well. Just to call attention that the third se uh, session will be exactly on democracy and the rule of law in Weber and Kelsen with uh, Stephen Turner. Uh, so we will approach that too, the question of constitution and rule of law in Weber. But go ahead, Eves. Well, very quickly, I, I completely agree with Edith on the uh, crucial importance of constitutionalism and constitution in Max Weber. This is also why uh, between Max Weber and Carl Schmitt or, or say NS, there is a, a wide gap. This is something quite different because constitution, constitution and the rule of law are part of this rationalization process, which is fundamental for Weber. But this is also true for capitalism. And I think that uh, for Weber, any concept of democracy, which would go against capitalism, uh, not only to control or give a meaning like the Protestant ethic to capitalism, but which would uh, uh, restrain capitalism, uh, would be, uh, uh, to some extent, irrational. And, and the last comment for, for Edith, I'm, I'm not sure of your interpretation of federalism and, and leadership. I mean, I, I live in France. Uh, it's a very centralized country and well, very good of having or trying to have charismatic leaders and president who embody our poor nation. Thank you, Eve. I, I was even going to ask if uh, anyone from France wanted to uh, comment on that, uh, because also in Switzerland, they, the whole time they're saying their problem is federalism, they're too fragmented. If only they could be more centralized, they were, all the problems would be solved. And I guess uh, people in France would maybe uh, see that differently. Um, all right. Uh, are there any more questions? Maybe a last one? 
So then maybe I do a small round just to close with the three uh, speakers. Ah, Sam? Yeah, Sam Wimster. Right. Uh, yes, I, I was on this constitutionalism as um, Germany's future form of state, which is not well known in the English speaking world. Momsen more or less ignored it in his book, other than to talk about federalism. And I translated it with a lot of help from Hinnock Bruins and, um, uh, and, and other German scholars. Um, a very difficult text, very, but the most important thing is it's a very dense text. And it talks about the institutions that will make democracy work in the Weimar period. And he's got this great phrase that, that democracy is only as good as its institutions. And, and it, if you, I mean, Weber also scales back, I mean, he looks at anarchism quite closely and says, you know, great idea, but it's not going to work because you've got to get through institutions. Um, so I, I would agree with, with Gangolf on, on, on that point and Eve, who also makes the same point. And the, the, the other, it's not a small point actually, but I'll, I'll put it briefly. Uh, Weber's interested in citizenship more than democracy, it seems to me. You know, there's, there's that famous line where he says, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the citizen of Florence would lay down his life for, for the city. And that, that's the essence of citizenship. And he tries to do the same for the German nation. And I guess you could say that's a still operative idea in some nations, but not many. Um, perhaps China, perhaps new nations, perhaps Israel. Um, but a lot of Western countries use mercenary armies, including the United States and the United Kingdom, effectively. Uh, they're not really national armies. And it, this leads me on to the thought that if you were going to ground democratic rights, you would have to do it in citizenship. And that Weber would therefore have to be seen as a rights-based theorist, which is a natural law idea. And he doesn't, he's, not, he's also interested in natural law. He talks about it quite a lot um, in a scattered way. And it may be that that's the route to go, that um, we, if, if Swiss democracy, if that's what you're suggesting, is in trouble, um, Victor, I'm not sure whether you were suggesting that, um, then it's going to find it very difficult for the reasons that all the speakers have been talking about, because the nature of capitalism we have now is, um, well, dot, 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 fill in your own answer, but it's not really uplifting um, for very many reasons. And so that you're forced back in some ways onto the idea of citizenship and rights um, so that's, that's my comment. All right. Uh, Edith, would you like to respond? Um, yeah, my point about Switzerland, I think the Swiss are fine, um, uh, com comparatively to, to most of us, even though it's very interesting to note that, um, and the plebis and the, the plebiscitary system that they have, I think functions quite well, but the participation is very low, right? Under 50% for the uh plebiscite you know for these uh, votes on all kinds of legislation and in the last elections i think they also had very low participation around 50 percent for the swiss parliament and just a an interesting comparison in argentina had all, over 75 percent last weekend and this was considered low um so that's an interesting contrast and in terms of mature and not so mature democracies uh i think it's very interesting to interrogate this concept as um, 
uh, which Aidit brought forward and Eve also, and Sedra also commented on. So maybe we should, we should just do a round. Uh, let's do maybe the inverted. So maybe you could do Sergio, Eve, and then close uh, close with Edit. Any last comments, Sergio? Yes, um, I'd like to 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 say that for me, um, and this it has to do with 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 what Gangolf said. Um, it's for me very important. Uh, uh, to think Weber as a political thinker, especially in his um, writings about Russia. Uh, for me, um, the, the situation of Russia for, uh, for him and um, all the discussion about the constitution and project of constitution, so uh, starts for, um, for him in these writings are need, are it's no worst. No. It's, they played a, a very important role, and um, I, I I think that a, a comparison uh, between these two moments, uh, Weber uh, 1905 1906, uh, with the late Weber, uh, would help a lot to to have a better. A comprehension of of his idea of uh, on democracy, but it's a thing that must be done. Thanks, Sergio. And maybe uh, just to comment with what Sam said: with if citizenship is the basis, then also migration comes into the fold, and that is also something where a comparison with the younger Weber would be interesting because that's something he's also never able to solve. There is no space for, uh, let's say multicultural citizenship concept in his uh in his thinking i think and this is also relevant today even if you think of israel palestine who gets to be a citizen where um you know these things could and with migration in general as a question today for democracy which i don't think we find a solution for in weber um because citizenship and the nation are so tied to each other uh eve any any comment <clears throat> Uh, uh, just two things. The first one is just an empirical, conceptual perhaps, uh, remark. Uh, I do not think that we should use the uh, notion of plebiscitary for Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Because plebiscitary uh, comes from above uh, in uh, most of uh, Swiss uh, votations, votes. It comes from, uh, uh, from, top down, uh, from bottom up. And uh, you don't have to forget that uh, a normal Swiss citizen will have the opportunity to vote three times a year on, say, 15 issues. So even though only 50% of the people vote for one issue or for one election, altogether, they vote quite a lot. And you can, for example, go and vote for three topics and uh, not for two others where you don't really know what to vote. So be careful interpreting the results. And coming back to Weber and democracy, I think that what can we make of Weber? What is interesting uh, in Weber on democracy? And I really think that the most interesting is not to turn Max Weber liberal as the US sociology during the Cold War did. I really think that we have to take Weber as an entity thinker, which is a great sociologist and which presents strong objections against any democratization process which would be substantial both at social level and at um, political level beyond the Tocquevillian uh, 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 vanishing of uh, status difference, uh, legal status uh, differentiations, and uh, a formal universal male citizenship. We have to be able to sociologically and politically respond to the challenges that he uh, works on, and this is interesting of Max Weber for me as a radical Democrat. I am a, more a radical Democrat and I think that it's fascinating how Weber is useful 
for such a perspective. Fantastic, Eve. Yeah, that's, this will be the topic of one of our other sessions. Also, what's his legacy for uh, radical thinkers? And, you know, he's been read by anarchists and socialists throughout his reception. We're going to ask ourselves why. The last point about Switzerland, you're totally right, right? These are referenda. Uh, I could, just couldn't find the word, and it's a very admirable part of the Swiss system and not destabilizing for the democracy at all, as people would say that this uh, is a possible consequence. But again, uh, let's say a third, 30 percent, maybe that's not, not that high, but quite a lot of the population who is uh, foreign or doesn't have Swiss citizenship, citizenship, maybe they were even born there, can't vote on these things. Uh, this is again the weak point, right, of uh, of this uh, liberal democracy, even in its more progressive forms. That and of course the it's definitely moder bottom up there. The you could say the one initiative, the the, the modern xenophobic politics of uh, polarizing against immigrants and etc. Was born in Switzerland as a referendum in the in in 1980. So I think that's very symptomatic that also uh, this re referendum aspect is not necessarily goes in a progressive direction, but still I find it quite admirable uh, in Switzerland. Edit, uh, just to close. Um, I think um, it was a very good uh, final word of Eve that Weber is still fascinating and. For me, it's important to think more about this interrelationship of politics and society. And, e and even now, the, the problem of the unorganized masses, as Weber said, says that I think as citizens, we have a political responsibility for that what is going on. And that it is too simple just to vote every four or five years. So this political Weber who was who fear felt very responsible what is going on in his society and in his country. And um I think this is the um yes, political impetus of this his thinking. And um I wish that we maybe reflect these more and more what we what what we can do for our development um, in our country and in our European Union or wherever we live yeah fantastic thank you Edith so thanks again for the speakers Serge Damat and Yves Saint-Omer um, again we our next session will be on December 7th and it will be organized by Lucia Pinto and Yanis Ketenas on Weber and values uh, democracy and values in Weber thanks for all the participants and questions and uh, see you next time thank you so much all right. thank you